is freedom of speech important enough that you would defend it even if it is being used by people who are dedicated to your own destruction? That's a question that is dealt with in this book called Defending My Enemy by Arya Nair. Now, this book is a little bit of a trip down memory lane. So for context, you have to go back to the late 1970s when essentially there was a big controversy in Skokie, Illinois over a threat to march by the National Socialist Movement. And what ended up happening was that so there, it's, there was a case that went before the United States Supreme Court called National Socialist Party of America versus the village of Skokie. And this is a trial that I've actually referenced a few times. Um, it was decided on June 14th, 1977. And the so National Socialist Party of America was an offshoot of the original American Nazi Party uh, led by George Lincoln Rockwell. That was le And this one was led by a guy named Frank Collin. Interestingly enough, it was later revealed that Collin was um, a Jewish person who had developed a self-loathing complex and ended up joining the Nazis. But in any case, this was one of the landmark cases of freedom of speech in America. And what Nayer goes through in this book is his own personal um, issues regarding this. So, so Nayer himself had been born in Germany in 1937 the son of two German Jews, and fled to Britain not long after that with his family. So he came to Britain as a very small child and eventually migrated to the U.S. and became a U.S. citizen. And by 1977, he was the head of the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. And what this book really documents is his issues with getting the ACLU to support freedom of speech cases for people who are racist bigots, people in the Ku Klux Klan or Nazi movements or various other white power movements or, or other racial supremacy organizations. There's the example of Father Terminello that he references. And for a, a book that's only about 170 pages, it is actually a great reference for a number of important cases that happened with regards to freedom of speech in the United States. And and he opens the conflict by t t telling about, um, you know, first of all, the issue that many ACLU members, because it was a membership organization for many years, I don't know if it still is, but it was a membership organization. And many decided, well, we're going to quit if you decide to defend these bigots because we supported the ACLU in order to defend freedom of speech for people who have progressive values and liberal values. And instead, you're actually using it in order to defend people that have the opposite, um, you know, point, points of view. So Nayer makes the point that when you have this principle where you believe in the freedom of expression, expression and freedom of speech, but you only apply it to people who have views that are convenient to your own worldview. Uh, in reality, it's a hollow and meaningless uh, place of value. And I, I think that it's interesting to note, this is something I didn't want to leave out. Uh, Arya Nair, Nair became later the, he, the, the first head of the Open Societies Foundation, the organization that George Soros has used in order to promote so-called open societies throughout the world. And the reality is, I wonder to what extent Arya Nair would, um, you know, would, would be interested in really George Soros's real definition of what an open society is. And maybe he is complicit. So I'm not going to, going to pretend, oh, this guy is just some stooge who's, who's uh, you know, is being manipulated by Soros. It could be that years after his role in the Skokie case, 
which if you're a person who has controversial views in the United States, you should view as one of the most important accomplishments for the free speech movement uh, in America for you, not just for the left, but, but for you. The Open Societies Foundation has, in a way, taken things backwards because in the technological era, we've seen that freedom of speech has been rolled back because, uh, you know, in, in certain circumstances, the people in power don't think that uh, people being able to voice their views should be a way to, um, you know, undermine their hold on authority and their lock on the propagation of information around the world. So that's actually something, um, again, this was in the 1970s, so Nayer makes reference to a smaller case that happened in Houston in the 1970s where one of these, uh, one of these uh, racist organizations had attempted to buy ad space on a Houston television station and simply put the the TV station decided, oh, we're, we're just not going to air it. So he made a decision. Well, you know, the truth is we can um, defend your right to freedom of speech, but we can't defend necessarily your access to a platform to distribute it, such as a TV station. And it's it's an interesting conflict at the time. But you have to remember that TV stations do have the right to editorial discretion. The question is whether an ad would be something that should be protected as freedom of speech. So there are a number of um, very important points that are raised in this in, in the course of this. Uh, in fact, um, he goes through uh, one example, which is in England, which is that uh, they had, for example, this um, prohibition on some uh, activities that were a breach of public order and how in the, in the United Kingdom, that's why we have a very huge difference with them. In the United Kingdom, their protections on freedom of speech are not guaranteed by a Bill of Rights or any other constitutional protection. So people have to basically fight in court and hope that the authorities are convinced that they're, they don't present a, da- a danger to the public order in order for them to be able to voice controversial opinions. And yet, people today are of the belief in the United States that putting further restrictions on freedom of speech through um, shadow banning and through other um, you know, devices that are meant to limit the scope of, of uh, distribution for racist or homophobic or uh, racial or religiously bigoted or other intolerant views. They believe that those restrictions are going to save society from bigotry. And it's and and he actually brings very important counterpoints from Weimar Germany, which is p- people like to say that it was the Nazis. Um, taking advantage of of the vacuum of too much democracy and too much freedom of speech in Germany in the 1920s that led to them coming to power. When Nayer actually goes back and and says, the reality is much different. In Germany, um, freedom of speech often was persecuted. You did have people who, uh, you know, they published very controversial works. Uh, I think one of the people he he referenced was George Gross, uh, an, an artist who published uh, something that was offensive to the German right wing, and he was imprisoned for a little while because of it. And yet he says, Arya Nair says, that there were many political crimes that were actually violent in nature, including murders that went unpunished throughout the whole period of Weimar Germany. And and it was, according to him, the lack of prosecution of political murders and other acts of violence that really led to the rise of the German, um, you know, the German Reich uh, under under Hitler. That was something that people didn't really 
uh, have any protection from because if you call the police on these stormtroopers and and by the way also on other political militias of the left uh, often they would do nothing because they didn't really feel that they could bring these people to justice anyway because the justice system wasn't really interested in prosecuting um, you know political violence and that should be in a lesson for today in the United States we have a lot of people who actually commit crimes that are that are of political nature, and yet they go unpunished. I don't think it's it's only murders and and violent acts that that are going unpunished. You have acts of corruption. You have acts of open um, collusion with uh, with corporations between the government and and big pharma or the government and defense contractors and things like that. So. I think that people in the United States have had a very naive way of thinking about how fascism came to power in Germany by thinking, oh, well, they gave the German people too much uh, rope in order to hang themselves by accepting these racist, um, you know, bigots as their as their leaders and voting them into power. That's actually not the way that Arya Nehru says that it happened. So on the whole, I think that if you're a person who has a genuine appreciation for civil liberties, whether or not you think that Arya Nayer's work at the time stands up uh, to this day. I think it's an important piece from the 1970s, right? So you can you can go back. To, of course, we don't know whether uh, I could go back and look, but um, it's, it's possible that Nayer's positions changed afterward. Um, and I'll, I'll go back and look. Uh, I've been trying to read a few of his uh, more um recent things and and look at some videos but uh in general he's he's stayed consistent in saying well the, the, well the Skokie case was the great moment for the ACLU the Skokie case by the way was one of the relics of the ACLU actually living up to the ideals that supposedly it st- it stands for and and I get it that some of you who are watching you see the ACLU as the embodiment of of evil, right? Because in many cases they they defend abortionists, they defend uh, you know a lot of in- extremely uh, left wing causes or whatever. But and and that's something that I think people people have a right to criticize an organization for taking very public stances that are against them. But at least in terms of this, at least in terms of the ACLU's treatment of the Skokie case. I think that they did a service to Americans because the truth is that we have in America today, uh, we do have people that have intolerant views. I just read something by Andrew Torva, the founder of Gab, where he essentially lays the blame for the Holodomor, the Ukrainian genocide. Uh, he, he, he asserts that it's basically something that was um, that's being covered up by Jewish Americans and, and uses such things as a quote by form, by Wiesenthal Center um, President Ephraim Zuroff to say, well, the Jews don't want us to know about it. And the reality is that um, I don't agree with Torba's points of view. I think that he's exaggerating uh, greatly in order to, uh, you know, get people to play along with some of his demagoguery. But I will never go to the degree where you had people in Skokie at the time saying, uh, you know, the, these people have no right to voice their beliefs. People like like Rabbi Mayor Kahana and other members of the community who, who said, well, we suffered enough under them 30 or 40 years ago. Why, why should they have the right to say these things? And the reason that they have the right to say these things, as hard as it might be to accept, is that once you... Uh, open Pandora's box and give the government the right to restrict the freedom of speech of someone else, no matter how repugnant they are, they will turn around and do it to you as well. And you see it happening. You see it happening in other countries like Canada and Australia. So really, um, I think that notwithstanding what he says, Andrew Torba is doing a great service to America by having a site such as Gab, even if that site includes, you know, many people who have repugnant views and, and um, you know, uh, offensive and 
edgy points of view <laughs> and um, ideas that are uh, basically salacious and, and unfounded and, and even conspiracy theories that, that are rooted in nothing. Uh, I, I've said this about people that I've personally confronted over their own lies and, and uh, innuendo, such as Ryan Dawson. I've said they should have the freedom of speech even though in many ways their speech has no redeeming value uh, because we're not here to... The America, the, the, the government of the United States, should, should not be policing the taste of its citizens and what information they consume. So yes, I definitely recommend it and I hope that you go out and try to find a copy because it wasn't easy for me, uh, but it's an important book to read in order to actually understand a lot of the implications of how hard it's been to defend freedom of speech throughout the generations. That's about it. Please like, share, and subscribe. Also subscribe to me on uh, BitChute, on Odyssey, as well as Rumble for all the video hosting platforms, as well as YouTube, and on Minds and Gab. Yes, I am on Gab, despite what Andrew Torva says, and you can find my newsletter below as well as my Telegram channel, and have a great night, and we'll see you later.